Okay, good morning, everybody. This class is about the, um, what's called the Dalet Tikkun Shrinta. The 10 um, Tikkunim, Tikkunim could mean rectifications, it could also mean receptacles um, of the Shrinta, of the Divine Presence. Uh, now, let me explain a little bit what this is all about. Uh, in order to explain it, let me put this screen up. <clears throat> Can everyone see the text now? Can everyone see the text? Yeah, good. Okay, so. This is a text from Kings, as you can see, and it says, it's talking about the prophet Elisha, We're sort of continuing in the idea of the um, prophecy, the prophecy and divine inspiration series. So, um, this is about uh, the prophet Elisha and a certain woman who had a tremendous respect and honored the prophet Elisha, and this is the uh, this is the background to what we're going to be talking about and, uh, about now. So let's just look at it quickly. <coughs> it says, "Vatomi Elisha," she says to her husband. You have the English here if you want. There's a holy person, a holy man that passes by us always, continually. Let's make for him Nasana alias Kirkatana. Let's make for him a small attic room, room in the attic in the wall higher up, and um, and the top of the house, in other words. Let us make for him, let us place for him there in this little room a bed and um, a table and a chair and a candelabra. This candlestick is really a candelabra. <coughs> when he comes to us, he'll he'll stay there. We'll we'll um, make him this little room so that he can stay there. So the Zohar, uh, in explaining this verse, this uh, these few verses, uh, says that first of all, let's let's look at it um, in in the context of the verse itself. We'll just look at the English for now. <coughs> She says to her husband, generally, whenever there's a she and a he involved in, a, in, a, um, in verses, so it can be understood, of course it's, it has to be understood literally as well, that it was a woman talking to her husband, but it also has to be understood as the body talking to the soul. The classic paradigm of this is Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is the soul, Sarah is the body. Now you might think that these are... Um, um, Terms which uh, you know don't fit with certain world outlooks, well, so be it. That, that may or may not be so. But don't think that just because uh, Sarah represents the body, that therefore there's anything lesser in her level of prophecy. In fact, quite the contrary. God tells Abraham, "You have to listen to the voice of Saul, uh, of Sarah." Lekol ishtachashama. Right? You have to listen to the to the. You have to listen to your wife. And uh, the truth is, in, uh, in terms of, hey, ladies, don't take that too far. Uh, <laughs> in terms of um, um, spirit of prophecy, it is important that the soul understands and listens to and works with the physical world because the whole purpose of our existence is really down here in this world. The soul comes down to this world not to leave the world, to be, become a hermit, to, um, to disappear from this world and not be involved in this world, but on the contrary, to be involved in this world in a holy way. Okay, so, she says to her husband, the soul says to the, uh, so the body says to the soul, now I know that this is a holy man of God. They're talking about the prophet uh, Elisha. Elisha, who passes by us continually. Says the Zohar, this is the spirit of holiness that passes over a person from time to time and uh, continually, in fact, it is available to people, continually available. There's, there are times when 
the spirit of holiness and the spirit of prophecy and the spirit of in divine inspiration is ready to imbue us and we just have to be ready to receive it. How can we be ready to receive it? So this is what the verse continues to explain. The verse is, so she says, please let us make a little chamber up in the wall of the house. Actually of the house should be, uh, it's understood, it's not said. Nasa na alias kirkhtana, let us make a, uh, an upper story room. That's basically what it is. But in the wall, in the wall. Now there's various explanations of what that means in the wall. Was it some kind of um, um, balcony or was it a loft room or whatever it is? It's irrelevant in, <coughs> in our context right now. Because the Zohar says, what does the wall mean here? The more wall means the walls of the heart. Make a chamber for the holiness in the walls of your heart, says the Zohar. And let us set for him, for the spirit of holiness, for this holiness, let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool or a chair, actually. I'm going to change that to chair. A chair. And a candelabra. Candlestick, candelabra. Can, candle, uh, candelabra. How does it go? Candelabra? No. Candelabra? I don't know. <laughs> so that when he comes to us, he can stay there. Let's see if it's... No, it's not right. One second. Um, yeah, it should be candelabra, right? Okay. That's how it should be, I think. Yes? Okay, good. Candelabra. So that when he comes to us, he can stay there. In other words, when he comes to us, when the spirit of holiness comes upon a person... And they've made the four receptacles mentioned here. When he comes, when they come to us, they can stay there. They can be that spirit of holiness, that spirit of uh, of, of purity. Has a place to reside. It can stay there. It can be there, at least temporarily, but for a an extended period of time, even if it's temporary. But some people it becomes permanent. Okay, so what we have to do, therefore, is explain what these four uh, things are. A bed, a table, a chair, and a candelabra. Now, um, the Zohar uh, explains that these are the various um, parts of prayer. But I'm not going to go into that now. There's a different explanation as well, an explanation that is brought from other parts of Kabbalah and from Hasidic teachings as well. And um, the, the, this is what they teach. What is the concept of a bed? The idea of a bed is uh, really, really two things. A bed represents the concept of what's called zivug. Zivug means, literally, the translation of Zivug would be coupling. But what it means is that there are clusters, there are sfirot, or clusters of sfirot, that when they come together, when they couple, then they produce, so to speak, children. When they couple together, when the parts, well, when the parts of him have a zivug, a zivug of parts of him, when there is a combination of forces, then there can be birth. When things are on their own, there's no possibility of birth. There is. That's very important to bring about the coupling. Now. <clears throat> In order to be able to understand how this coupling comes about, we have to go to some one of the teachings of the Arizal, Rabbi Yitzhak Luria. Rabbi Yitzhak Luria says that he explains that there are um, various levels of soul, which we've spoken about many times before, five levels of soul, five levels of consciousness, if you want to put it that way. 
And starting off from the bottom, from the lowest level, we have what's called nefesh. Nefesh is consciousness of the physical body, physical consciousness. Nefesh, the life, the life force of the body. That's called nefesh. Ruach is the life force of the emotions. Ruach is the emotional component, really, of a person, the emotional flow and life force of a person. Neshama is the intellectual capacity, the intellectual force of a person's personality. That's the intellectual um, consciousness. <clears throat> then there's two transcendent levels of consciousness, which are called Chaya and Yechida. Chaya has to do with the will, and Yechida is really the soul as it is in its source, or the soul as it is attached to its source. Says the Arizal, there are two times primarily when a person can have a revelation of a transformative revelation of the essence of his soul of this level of Yechida. There are two times in particular, it can happen at any time, but in the two times in particular, which are called Mesugal, which are particularly advantageous or particularly propitious for this to, uh, to in fact happen. One of those times is when a person is doing what's called nefilat apayim. Nefilat apayim, after one says um, the standing prayer, then there is a, a, another part of the prayer which is called, comes right after, it's called nefilat apayim, where one, one's uh, head cover your face with your arm, and uh, it's sort of... Um, um, it's a time of vidui. Vidui is really translated as confession, but it doesn't really... Confession has sort of a lot of negative connotations. This is not a negative connotation as such. It's more of a... Um, it's the idea of... One second, I'm oh, sorry. There we go. It's the idea of... Um, understanding where it is that you are and acknowledging where you are and where you have been as opposed to where you should be. There's another, that's one time. The second time is one when one says, Kriyat Shema Alamita, and one falls asleep when you, go, when, when you say the last prayer before going to sleep. This is also a time of Vidoya, it's a time of Again, the word is confession, although, again, it's, it's really the wrong word. It's a time of what's better called in Hebrew, cheshbon hanefesh. When you make a calculation of the entire day's um, events and how you handle them, everything that went on during the day, and make decisions for the future and um, try as best as one can to rectify the past. In other words, what happened during the day that wasn't so good. So this particular time, says that result, is a time that's mesugal, is particularly auspicious and propitious for one to receive a higher level of consciousness, the highest level of consciousness. In other words, yechida of the soul, that highest level of consciousness of the soul, the consciousness of the divine presence. So they explain, therefore, that when, when the woman says to her husband, let us make for him there a bed, that means in terms of what we have to do, that is the time of, let us set aside a time for cheshbon hanefesh. When we come to the end of the day, we look back over the day from the beginning of the day all the way through the day, try and recall all of the details, what went well, we do more of. What went badly, we try and avoid, and we try and rectify. We try and um, um, make amends if amends are necessary. We're just trying to avoid those kinds of situations or those kinds of negative things uh, if it's not possible to do anything else. Avoidance is at least uh, as good. There's some things that one can't help happening, but you can try and avoid them. So that concept of making a bed or placing a bed there doesn't mean going to sleep. On the contrary, it is before one goes to sleep to make a proper calculation so that when you wake up, you really wake up as a different person. Now, um, <clears throat> I don't know if anyone here has a, um, owns a dog, but 
if you own a dog and you leave, and you and the dog sleeps in the, in the house, and you have a little bed for the dog, you probably see uh, the way a dog goes to sleep. Very often, when a dog goes to sleep, what it does is it uh, goes around chasing its tail. <clears throat> it goes around chasing its tail, and then it flops down in the bed. <clears throat> um, that's not the way we should go to sleep. The way a dog goes to sleep is uh, not the way a human being should go to sleep. A dog doesn't sit down and think what happened during my day, what went well, what could have been better, what am I going to do in the future to make sure that things will be better. That's the concept of bed. So the day really begins with the night before. Preparing for the next day means doing your cheshbon on efesh the night before. The preparation for tomorrow happens at the end of the previous day before we go to sleep. And then hopefully we'll wake up sort of a different person. <clears throat> okay. What's a, uh, a table? The table says, uh, says the, um, uh, the, the various Hasidic sources are your input during what do you feed yourself on a table represents food and nourishment what do you nourish your soul on during the day what do you nourish your soul on during the day is it all negativity listening to the news most of it bad because bad news sells is it slutty magazines is it garbage is it uh, negative talk about other people what do you feed yourself on if one feeds oneself on a diet of uh, um, um, junk food, in a spiritual sense, if you feed your soul junk food all day, you can expect uh, a healthy, a healthy soul. The table represents, therefore, that which one sets in order to counter the negative influences and forces which are all around us and which most people succumb to most of the time. Neg negative attitudes, hopelessness, despair, anger, um, uh, all those kinds of things, all those kinds of negative, uh, negative attitudes. King David said, set for me a table against my enemies. Against those people who cause me trouble. In other words, if you set the table up in the right way, if you set up the nourishment, the spiritual nourishment you're going to get, you set it up. These are the boundaries. These are parameters. I'm not going to go out of my boundaries when it comes to what I allow in. Then it's negatory against those things that will bother and disturb and hassle and weaken and... Uh, weaken me and cause me to eventually succumb, God forbid. There's a famous story about one of the uh, students of the Baal Shem Tov that uh, he came to the Baal Shem Tov and he asked how, it is, how, he can control, how he can control himself. He tends to look at things that he's not allowed to and, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, and what can he do? So he says, go to my student, to the Baal Shem Tov, to this other man, Go to my student, Reb Wolf Kitzes. That was his name, Reb Wolf. And uh, he'll help you. So the man travels to the city, finds out where Reb Wolf uh, Kitzes lives. He goes to the city and uh, eventually finds the house of Reb Wolf and it's already evening. And uh, he goes to the door, knocks on the door, expecting you know uh, to be welcomed in, as would be customary. And uh, nothing, no response. He hears people, there are people in the house, he can hear, he can hear them talking and so on and so forth. So he knocks a little bit louder and louder and louder and louder and there's no response, no one comes to the door. So he doesn't have anywhere else to go and uh, he doesn't know where there is, uh, you know, he doesn't have money anyway for a hotel or whatever, a motel or whatever it is, an inn. So he sort of uh, just sits down next to the door on the steps and that's where he spends the night. In the morning, Reb Wolf opens the door and he gives him a, a hearty welcome and welcomes him in, a cup of coffee or whatever it is that he gave him, warms him up a little bit by the fire. 
And uh, he said to him, uh, why didn't you open the door for me last night? You heard me knocking. Why didn't you open the door? So Revolse said to him, that's the lesson that you have to learn. If you don't, if you decide you're not going to open the door, don't open the door. That's the lesson that you have to learn. And that he learned his lesson. Don't look at things that you're not allowed to look at. Put your uh, parameters up, what I'm going to look at, what I'm going to listen to, what I'm going to uh, be involved with. And if something is not within that narrow um, framework, it not, it's not allowed in. That's it. The door's locked. Sorry, the door's locked. That's what the table represents. The table represents the idea of what we nourish ourselves on and we can refuse to eat certain certain things. Just like the laws, the kosher laws forbid a person from eating certain types of food. There are certain types of spiritual food we just don't eat. They're treif, not kosher. We push them away. That's the table. What's the chair? So the chair uh, is two things. Um... First of all, a chair means, what do you do in a chair? You sit in a chair. So the idea of sitting, of making things sit down, in other words, settling things down, means on the one hand to do things in a settled, steady, constant kind of a way and not just um, you know, try it once with tremendous fervent, uh, fervency and, 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 and enthusiasm. And then, uh, you know, a couple of days later, it's already boring and it's gone. Yeah, it's work and it has to be done constantly and it has to be done uh, properly and uh, with, uh, with um, perseverance and so on and so forth. But the word um, also, the word chair in Hebrew or kise, kise can be written as follows case aleph yeah in other words to um there is a sort of so to speak um you can say it as two words here we are like this yeah case and aleph case means from the word kisui kisui is to cover over when the aleph is covered over, the aleph, what is the aleph? The aleph, it means alufo uh, shel olam, godliness. When godliness is covered over. So the chair, the kise, represents the idea of uncovering the godliness. Uncovering the godliness within everything. In the words of, in the, in the system of the Zohar, this is the prayer of Shema, the Kriyat Shema prayer. The Kriyat Shema prayer. And uh, this uncovers the Aleph, the oneness. The, the letter Aleph is, the every letter in Hebrew has a numerical value. The letter Aleph has a value of one. So it's uncovering, uncovering the oneness underlying all of creation, uncovering the one. The Lufo Shel Olam, God. Godliness, the one that was with that, that that's within us and that we are part of. So, chair therefore represents the idea of sitting down and contemplating this idea of the oneness of God, which includes all of creation. Finally, we come to the idea of a candelabra. What's a candelabra? A candelabra is the light that's given forth. I forgot to switch off this phone. I'm sorry. Uh, a candelabra is the light that we, what, what, what makes us, what lights us up in life? What illuminates us? What is it that when we, we're doing it or when we're in it, what's the zone in which we glow, if you want to put it that way, to use modern terminology. What is the zone in which we glow? What is the area of our lives that that's what we shine in? Now, everyone shines in some area of life, but it could be that uh, many, many years down the road, 
that which made us shine when we, we were younger, we sort of uh, were too busy with other things and we've forgotten what it is to some extent to shine. We've forgotten what it is to glow. We have to go back to look for those things and it's noticing and it'll help us. What will what, help us is when we do a cheshbon an nefesh, when we do the bed part, then we'll start to realize what, what causes us to shine. And that shining, when we feel that we're glowing and we're shining, and we're alive and, we're, uh, and we're, 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 we're giving out light and we're putting light into the world, sort of a beacon of, uh, of, 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 uh, of holiness and of, uh, of righteousness and of uh, um, something that people can uh, um, guide themselves by, that kind of candelabra, then... Um, that's our zone. That's where we. That's where we have to spend at least some time every day doing that. At least some time every day doing that. Of course, maybe one has to build up. It's not for once a week at least, but uh, should be every day. One spends a certain amount of time doing that kind of thing. Those areas in which we, in which we shine. Um, okay. And the purpose is so that when he comes to us, when the spirit of purity that we said before, the holy man, which we all have in our own souls, so that when that spirit of holiness comes to us, they can stay there. These are the three, the four things rather, that bring us to the ability to, um, to make a home, so to speak, for the holiness that's within us, to make it revealed. Now, there's an interesting thing. If you take the initial letters of each of these words, the Hebrew words, it would be Mishkan. I'm sorry, it would be uh, Mita. Mita. And then Kisei. And then, um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm messing it up. Shulchan. Shulchan could be spelled, Shulchan could be spelled this way, it could be spelled either way, it doesn't matter. Kisei. And then, menor and then uh, uh, menorah is a candelabra, but you sometimes have words in Hebrew, I guess you have it in English as well. A candelabra, what's the, what's the shortest form of candelabra? So in Hebrew, you have a, say, a similar thing. Instead of saying menorah, you can just say ner. Right? Ner. So the form was, shortest form of candelabra would be candle, like the candle on the candelabra, right? So the same thing in Hebrew, you have menorah, you have ner. Now, if you take the initial letters of each of these things, right? You take the initial letters of each of these words, that spells of the word, guess it, mishkan, mishkan, which means tabernacle, tabernacle. Right, Mishkan. That equals Mishkan. Mishkan, tabernacle. When when the uh, the letter Nun, this letter comes at the end of a word, it becomes a long letter. But it's the same as it's the same as this letter here. Right? Okay. So that's the Mishkan. The Mishkan is the tabernacle, the temple. So in other words, all of these things together make the temple in which the holy presence resides. That is what uh, what we're doing over here. Okay, so, do we have any questions? No questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> 